been a regular panellist on BBC Radio 4's Gardener's Question Time for almost 25 years now. I think I'm right in saying it's the longest running radio programme ever. It's been going for 75 years and every week it goes to a different place in the country and it answers gardeners questions. Today I'm here waiting for Matthew Pottage who's the curator at the RHS Garden at Wisley and I'm also waiting for Jemima Rathbone who's the producer of Gardeners Question Time and we're going to record a feature on my rose meadow. Then we're going to pop into Stanford and we're going to record a programme. I hope you enjoy seeing a behind the scenes look at how we do this. So we are here this afternoon. I feel like I've got the best gig doing this. We are in Bunny Guinness's back garden. I'm surrounded by roses, beautiful yew hedges, the birds are singing. I want to see everything. Bunny, it's such a treat to be here. Uh, what have you got in store for us? Oh, you're so kind. I thought you might be interested to see my new rose meadow because it's a bit of an experiment. I started it last year, so it's very young, very embryonic but um, I'm just trialling it. And I love roses because you can use them in so many situations. They never seem to go out of fashion. And I think if you have them in a meadow, it's just a nice loose way to use them. But I want to keep the structure in the winter. I don't want it to look like a load of silage and nothingness in the winter. I, want, I still want it to look great all the year round. This sounds intriguing. Okay, so yeah, very familiar with roses, very familiar with meadows, not so familiar with the two of them. Okay. I, I'm looking forward to it. Come, Lead the way. Lead come the this way. way. Okay, now this looks like the centrefold out of a country living magazine. And of course it would. I mean, this is beautiful, Bunny. So there's spires of foxgloves. There's the foxtail lily, Eremurus, that are standing taller than I am. There's lovely, loose, young growth of hazels like you've hard pruned. And then roses, alliums. I mean, it's uh, dreamy, I think is the word I'm looking for. And... Tell me more, because this doesn't look like an everyday meadow to me, but it's got that soft looseness of a meadow. So is this just what you're looking to achieve? Well, it's very dynamic, isn't it? Because it's its first year, and I did all the roses from cuttings, pretty much. Right. So I've done lots of rosa mutabilis. So those are about 300 mil high, something like this. And they are in amongst this lot, but you can't see them, because, as you say, the Eremurus is towering above us. Um, so it, it's going to be very changeable over the next three or four years, I think, as the roses come up. Um, and then I'll have less concentration on the foxgloves and things like that mm. and the campions, they'll come out. But I'm amazed how well the foxtail lilies have done because we get so many questions, don't we, on Gardens Question we Time. Do. They we put do. them in and we they do. never see them again. <laughs> so much so that I actually rang up John Armand and I said, why have they done so well? But I'm <laughs> thinking about it, actually. Um, I This was all comfrey. This was just a mass of comfrey here before under the hazels, that low-growing symphytum yeah. hibcote. And it's been there probably for 15 years. And comfrey increases the organic matter and the NPK content mm. massively. So I think maybe it's very rich. And they don't like being crowded, as mm. you know. Mm. And so I think the rich soil, which, I mean, normally it's as dry as dust, this soil. It's really dreadful. But I think that's what's maybe made the difference. Yeah. Well, the results are incredible. And then the roses themselves, tell me a bit about the spacing, because obviously they're small, but there's quite a lot in a space. So did you have a rough kind of, you know, like three per metre square or less? Or? I, no, I've done about one per, uh, probably about three metre centres. Okay. It's not a very big meadow, is it? Should we say this? Because um, it is probably in this order of, what would you say, 10 metres by 15 metres, something mm. like that. It's not massive. It's about 15 Fulham Gardens, but I would be used to. <laughs> But at Guinness Acres, yes, it's a tiny little corner. Tiny little pocket handkerchief, darling. <laughs> yes, absolutely. But there's no grass grass, no knowable no. grass. So I have Which... got grasses in there. Um, so I've got some nice luzula and things like that that are evergreen. So I want something there in the winter and I've got ferns. Um, and then mainly rosa mutabilis because I love the changing colour of mutabilis. Yeah, well, it's so good. Such good value, isn't it? It's Such amazing. Um, we've got it on one job growing under cork oaks and they're six metre high multi stem cork oaks and the rosa mutabilis at the foot of these does brilliantly. You know, yeah. they put up with such competition. And then we've also got rosa windflower. Um, which were in before, but they were rather dwarfed by the hazels. But I love windflower, and it's called windflower because it, 
it looks a bit like an anemone, which is also windflower, the name for an anemone. And it was David Austin's favourite rose. Yeah, I've never come across that. It looks really well here. And it, how it hot, I mean, you've got some ferns over by that yew hedge. It just hovers above. And then in the winter time, so you've got some of these clipped yews in here. So you've got yeah. this backbone of structure. You've got these lovely arches, which I'm guessing you're going to train the hazel. And over. roses, absolutely. Exactly. Yes. And then will you leave it all for winter structure, then cut it back, all the herbaceous in spring? Or? Well, it depends on the winter, doesn't it? Because if we have a very wet, mild winter, it will look pretty miserable, I think. Mm. The topi will stand out, the features will stand out. There's a nice font I got from my mum there and things like that. And the lovely little circular tree seat from eBay for 18 quid. Wasn't that a snip? How do you find <laughs> stuff like that on eBay? Whenever I look at stuff on eBay, <laughs> it never looks like that. That looks... It does need a coat beautiful. of paint, let's be honest. I like things going <laughs> yes, no, That's very, very yeah. cute there. But no, I think there's enough structure with a little path winding through, the little stone set path. I think... I think there will be enough in the winter, but if it's a very cold winter, then I'll leave obviously the silhouettes of things like the eryngiums and stuff like that. Yeah. And they will look yeah. lovely frosted. But I don't know if we'll ever get any of those again, do you? I know, those really cold winters with hoarfrost, like you see in the magazines, and in reality it's, it hovers about three degrees and it's drizzly yeah. uh, and doesn't freeze at all. You've also got one of my favourites in here, the Rosa Glauca. Yes, that just, that's lovely. Too much of that. yeah. And of course, it's important to mention this whole thing is full of bees, pollinators, I just saw butterfly go past because there's so much in here for wildlife too. So it's also really, you know, kind, planet-friendly garden, isn't it? <laughs> and John Cushion is climbing up the tree. Mm -hmm. So that pink rose there I got from his garden ages ago when we were recording in Northern Ireland and took a few cuttings in the sink <laughs> and brought them back. <laughs> and um, he didn't know what it was, but it goes on and on and on and on. And I love it because it reminds me of John every time I see him. Uh. It. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and tell me more about the rose propagation, because I know you grow your own roses. You mentioned a lot of these are young plants. I can tell they're homegrown. Uh, what, what's How your, can you what, tell they're homegrown? They don't look like they've just been bought for oh, £25 see. Pounds in oh, a right. square pot in oh, the no, garden no, no, centre. No, no. They right. look a bit more homegrown, home basically. Grown. Yeah, so I, I've got a hydropod, which is one of these propagators um, that has a cover and it has um, a load of sponge plugs in it and it has spray misting under the plugs. So the stems are misted and the water's kept at a constant temperature. Now, before I had that, I did actually just root them and I always take them in. I take them and I see them in flower in someone's garden and I like them and I say, <laughs> yeah. oh, please. And, so literally um, a greenwood cutting. A greenwood cutting yeah. and I put it in shade and I mist it or put a bag over it if it's very hot. Mm. And they usually root very fast like that. I never do them in, well, I do sometimes do them in the autumn, but not nearly so often. But in the hydropod, they've been rooting in like three weeks. Wow. Massively fast. Wow. Everything roots so fast in that um, so it's really easy and people say it's not so good on their own roots sometimes but I think I think they're great most of the a lot of the roses here are grown on their own roots and I think they do really really well I think some roses root easier than others um, but uh, so far I find m most of them do quite mm. well to mm. be honest well I'm not going to argue with it because you've got staggering roses here you do always recommend them on GQT but when I come here I can understand why it's uh, it's dreamy So this is behind the scenes at Cardinal's Question Time and I'm with Paul, Paul Bogdell. You've been recording us in this amazing cave of yours for yeah. years, haven't you? Travelling uh, all over the country. Yes, yes. This how, is where they've gone. How long have you been doing it with us? Oh, I don't know. It must be at least 10 years. 10 at least years. 10 years, yeah. And when you're not doing Gardener's Question Time, you have another life, don't you? Do you do pop concerts and um, interesting I, I do things? I play in a band. Oh, you play in a band? Yeah. Oh, I thought you, you recorded pop concerts and things. I do a bit of that as well. I do record jazz and things like that. And I record another show called The Kitchen Cabinet. Oh, right. So, um, yeah, quite a wide variety, really. I, I, I like to do many things. And this is just an ordinary van that someone's kitted out. Yes. My predecessor, a guy called Pete, Pete Freshney, he basically built this. And it's like a recording studio in a van. Yes. We've got a mixing desk here and you can record... Um, multi-track onto laptops and um, you can actually see the audience and you can see the stage as well and the producer can sit here yes so when we're doing the show yeah Jemima will come and sit w beside you that's right Jemima will sit here and she can talk to Peter by pressing on that button there so if I don't know if something comes up that 
Peter Gibbs being the presenter, That's obviously, right. yes. Yeah. And so carry on, if something... Well, I'm, I'm trying to think of an example. You probably know better than me, but something, something that needs clarification or something like that in the yeah. show, she might say, ah, oh, da, da, da. And she'll whisper into his ear. That's right, and he'll, yeah. Right. He'll somehow blend it seamlessly into what he's saying. Uh, he that must be quite difficult for him to take instructions from yeah. Jemima and to keep the show on the road, as Absolutely. it were. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Oh, this is an amazing van, isn't it? I see you've got teacups up there. So yeah. you obviously make yourself at home yeah. and you've got all your backstage passes there to all sorts of Humphrey Littleton, oh, yeah. all these gigs you've been doing, yeah. energy, yeah. media passes. What's the most exciting thing you've ever recorded in this amazing Ooh, Sputnik? That's a good question. Um, been so many. I mean, I, I used to record Glastonbury a lot, <gasps> which was good. That must be difficult though, because you've got the sound in yeah. a venue like that. Yeah. How, how do you get it right? You know, you've only got one go. It, it, you just have to be on your toes, basically. I mean, we used to say the first song in a set, you could say it might be a bit shaky, but by the end of the first song, you really had to get everything in order because you wouldn't have a sound check. So the, the band would be, play, be playing the first song of their set and you would be literally, oh, that's too loud, that's too quiet, and very, very quickly, and also triaging like small problems, forget about that, I can't hear the lead vocal or something, you know, and trying to think what's mo more important in the mix. Mm. So what qualities, I mean, do you have, do you think, to make a good sound? I mean, you're obviously highly technical. Um, you got a good ear? Hopefully. <laughs> zoom out a little bit and then listen to the big picture. Not, yeah. not get hung up on a small detail, which is very easy to do when you're sound mixing. You might, there might be a drum that you're listening to yeah. while something major is going on in the mix because you're so focused on that drum, you miss the major thing. So you have to keep pulling back and look, looking at the bigger picture. Oh, and right. The music, definitely, yeah. and everything else. Yeah. And with Gardener's Question Time, what's the most difficult thing with us? Um, <laughs> it's a lovely show, Gardener's Question Time, to mix. Um, I suppose, really, the most difficult thing technically would be very, very quiet questions. Because sometimes you get people that are just almost, you know, just speaking very quietly. So then can you tell Jemima to say, them to say it again louder? Um, normally we, we compensate on the mixing desk, but it's right. more difficult in the hall because Steve, who's doing the sound in the hall, will try and push it up on the PA system. Yes. But the limit there is that if he pushes it up too much, it comes out the speakers, back down the microphone and goes around in a circle, then you get feedback, which is dreadful. So mm. you can only push it so far before that you get this squealing sound, whereas in here I can push it as much as I want. Mm. Mm. I see it's all insulated, this outside broadcast fan, isn't it? Yeah. it? It's just got insulation sound things, so you don't, if someone's sick outside, if you I shut the doors, you won't hear it, you That's just right. hear us. That's good, yeah. yeah. And you can see them all in there now. They've come in very early, haven't they? they? Have. Yeah. They usually do, don't they? It's yes, it's an exciting yeah. event. Yeah. yeah. Great. Lovely. Well, thank you for explaining it to me. Now I know very a bit welcome. more about it. I hope we have a good show tonight. What do you reckon? Do you reckon it'll be a good buzz in there? I think so, yeah. So. Nice town, Stanford, isn't it? It's beautiful. Yeah, looks like they're keen gardeners. I'm sure they are. Yeah. See you later. Thanks you. a lot. Bye bye. Well, so we're in the green room. Are you both very, very nervous before this recording in oh, Stanford? Terribly so. Bob, you told me you've been doing this for years, haven't you? 25 yeah. years. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, 25, 25 born, years. Since before I was born. Before you were born, oh my God. <laughs> and um, Bob, you told me that you're never nervous. Well, I'm not. I don't well, believe I'm, I'm it. I'm playing it up for the camera, come on. You, you love it, don't you? Yeah, I can see absolutely. you really I spring do, yeah. to life I when do. the microphone comes on. I know, give me a microphone and I'm there. Yes, oh, and Peter Gibbs, Peter Gibbs, the chair Peter is here. To come, oh, hello. Come on, Peter, do you want to come and sit here We've beside us? Very briefly, this is, We've this got is show the to do in most... about half an hour. I've got okay. questions to Can you come through. closer, please, darling? Because we need to see Always you running. and hear you. Always. And hear you. you. There we are. That? What? Yes. He's got questions to go through. Uh -huh. No, but not with us. He's going through them with yes, Jemima. Yes, yes, yes. We've got it? to yeah. choose the questions. So we're in the green surprise room. You the with. show will start in about an hour. Bob says he's not nervous. Matt, who is the new, you're the youngest boy ever Am to I? do yeah, this, yeah, I think. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yes, youngest boy. I started when I was 12. <laughs> but I you're the youngest person on Gardener's Question Time. Would you say ever? Because you are how old? Uh, when I started doing this, I think I was about 33. And you have a wealth of information. Do I? Yeah, yeah, you oh, always surprise me. But Matt. She said I was rude earlier. Matt <laughs> runs Wisley. You're the creator of Wisley. So that is a pretty meteoric thing to do at your tender age. It's okay, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it's okay. Yeah, but it's I am still going. very nervous before these. 
been oh, good. Before, I think so, because you don't know what they're going to ask you. It is for you guys. It's yeah. easy for me. I just oh. have to say, oh. here's the question. Yeah. <laughs> Give us an answer. Thank you. And Peter well, Gibbs well. is the renowned weatherman. He was You would have oh, seen him on television you. all the time telling us it was going to rain oh. and pour and have hurricanes. Um, and always got it right. Yeah. Always funny. got and it and right, of course. And he's the best person to bring up if you're having an outdoor party and you don't know what the weather's going to be like. He's ideal for that. But anyway, Bob, I think you and I always argue, don't we? No. Yeah. <laughs> never, never argued with you, Bunny. <laughs> never, ever, ever. I know. Oh, I'm I've always used to be the person to sit sat between you. I always feel like I'm the more neutral person as you two are arguing the toss over the table either side of me. Keep but you don't apart. take sides or well you take sides as to who you think is right, but it's not always the same side, no, is no, it? It's no, not always. Yeah, no, yeah. you take it in terms of talking crap, so I exactly. But that is what's the beauty of the show, isn't it? That every every answer could have every question could have ten different answers. Yeah, and no I one would so. be right. Exactly. And it's what your for Bob. experience or what you've tried or what's gone wrong. And also, I think our different skill sets, because as you know, I've never fessed up with a veg question, which Bob is going to be. We've just all got different. That's why yeah. I really enjoy whenever there's a veg question, giving handing it, to it me. over to you. Yeah. <laughs> look at terror on your face. <laughs> you don't make eye contact. You don't look at him and anything. Yeah, so what I, do you do with it? I don't, like I don't know. Un- I don't like the unusual like ornamentals. You know, mm. there are there's so many ornamentals. There's mm. ones that I've never yet heard of. Yeah. Oh, there's ornamentals no one's heard of. I yeah, mean, it's yeah, like that, true. isn't I mean, it? Yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah, if you go with Roy Lancaster around somewhere, you'd, I thought I knew that, but something else <laughs> entirely. <laughs> so, Peter, is it your decision? I didn't realise that. I thought it was Jemima in the OB van who says, go to Matt, go to Bob. No, no, it's no. you that chooses. Yes. <gasps> yeah. So you're the one that we should butter up first. Well, you know, <laughs> I, I, I'm open to it. I'm just the money. It's a question. They make a lot less nerve-wracking. Completely <laughs> blank so far. Yeah. Um, We've still got to go through them yet. Actually, it's... And it's, pick out the stinkers. When I first did it, we had the questions a fortnight in advance. So you had to bone up. You had to... Everyone would give the same damned answer. Yeah. Mm. It was just done by... Ro- it was horrible. What's more is by having to read up on it beforehand. It just spoils it. There's nothing wrong with not knowing the answer. Yeah. yeah. What, there's, there's something wrong with giving a wrong answer, but there's mm. nothing wrong with saying, mm. no, I've never grown that. Mm. Mm. I mean, if it was something, if it was potatoes, like me saying I've never grown potatoes, it wouldn't be plausible. But if it was something really unusual, um, r- say Rodocatum, something that I've. Radicchio. What did you say? Rodocatum. You know, the, the, the Sounds like a Victorian. Oh, Rodocatum. See, they're arguing already. Oh, the latter. Rodocatum. Well, you see, oh, unfortunately, okay. I'm, I'm self taught, so I, I've never heard a lot of these well, things. Well, that's a dead language. So yeah, it's exactly. exactly. so a dead want. language, so you can, you can pronounce it how you want. But uh, <laughs> I do have problems with reading these because I read them phonetically. So that that thing out there is actually a poor tag of <laughs> and a monge too is a man get out I know exactly yeah. but Bob um, so but so then when when Trevor Trailer started producing he was the one that brought in that we didn't see the questions beforehand before him when it was done by the BBC they yes. had them a fortnight beforehand yes. and then they was it was actually dished out you're going to answer this one you're going to answer that one Trevor came in and said that's ridiculous <laughs> you guys know your job you're doing it on the stage. And that's, it's so much better because it's like that. Oh, it's mm. much more spontaneous. Mm. And actually, you know, as a panel of three, it, mm. it's very, very rare that a question actually yeah, stumps all three. Yeah. Virtually yeah. never. I and it's still, it's still, after all this time, amazes S- uh, me that Celestris, you can do uh, that. Celestris, uh, Celestris uh, the climber. Celestris. Yeah, I remember, I, I wasn't on the panel, but I remember hearing one once, and it was the old panel. And uh, it was when they, they had some questions come in at the end, which weren't, and they had, it was one of those, that, and nobody on the panel mm. knew it. Mm. Didn't they? Mm. Well, Bloody vigorous. Oh, yeah. well, it's, it's not that common, though, is it? It's, no, it's, no, it's, you it's don't pretty see it rare. At all. And it's so easy. There are so many plants. So that's, we do need a. I, I always joke the others are actually there to keep me upright. You know, but <laughs> <laughs> I can't answer all the questions because there are too many ornamentals. Any look, I do look, look there aren't going to be any questions or any answers unless I go no. and actually pick we'll some look. out. So, so this is what happened. I'll have to Peter, love you and leave you. Peter's now going with Jemima. The people have come into the hall. They've put in their questions, and Jemima and Peter will pick out the stinkers for us. I'm going to look in that mirror to see if I can <laughs> see what the questions are. 
we're going to go in the other <laughs> dressing room. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes, just a pile of fish. And then, and then we will hear them when, when Peter reads them out to us on stage. And if we don't know the answer, I tend to look at the floor in the other direction. And then, <laughs> if he's in a bad mood, he'll ask me. <laughs> well, now, buddy. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. We'll see you later. And 
Yeah, at about a metre and a half, the stone goes incredibly narrow, and I would imagine it went through a stressful period at that time. Oh, that's pretty strong to stop. Yeah, I think maybe somebody forgot to water it for about two years. <laughs> <laughs> and then life improved again, and it, um, it fattened up and off it went. So, I mean, okay, you could find somebody with a bigger house, but you can also propagate these quite easily from stone cutting. It's, it's quite a, 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 you know, a brutal process, literally taking a sharp knife to it, slicing a piece off, leaving it callous or dry for you know, a couple of days, and then rerouting it in quite a sandy mix. I mean, that funny point I find quite disturbing, something I kind of want that gone. So, you know, maybe take off, you can do quite big cuttings. I mean, you could do like a, a 30 to 60 centimetre cutting of the top, Reroute that, start that again. It's a great time of year to do it because the day is obviously bright and sunny and these things enjoy the sunshine, as you know. And then once that's rooted, I'd be tempted to just give it a rest. But it will, where you cut it, if you keep it, it will start to branch and you'll get other small buds forming and then you'll get uh, temples then. They will look like the pencil light. Uh, but yeah, I wouldn't give it away. I would be brave, do a big cutting and just start again. Oh, good stuff. Can you take a cutting out of the middle, as it were, Matthew, or do you have to have a top and a bottom? Or you know, you, bottom? you can take sections, because often they're grafted, it can be used as a grafting understock to graft with a cacti on, but it would be the most ugly cutting in the world, <laughs> just stopping a big cut. I mean, unless you wanted a branching cacti, I mean, you could do that. Uh, I would generally go for the, the tip, because it looks better. But you find this wondrous, I always like to take things to extremes. If you just let it hit the ceiling, and at the moment it's probably 75 mil from the, the ceiling, mm -hmm. and it will get there, and then it will go and follow the, the angle of the ceiling. <laughs> <laughs> and so it has an arched cactus, and, that, and it will just go on. But it would, that would happen. Yeah, yeah. Lovely, wouldn't it? It's almost because we've had that funny bit, aren't yeah. we? <laughs> it, it would be eccentric, but it would be unique, and I think it would be quite fun to try that. And then you could lug on to the other side and arch it the other way. And then <laughs> Uh, I mean, we've suddenly, it's 
suddenly got very warm, hasn't it? And when you get when it suddenly gets warm, the algal blue algal bloom often takes off. And my, I would think mine at the weekend, and that has suddenly got lots of blanket weed in. And so with that, I've got some bacterial a compound of bacteria in it, and that cleans it up almost instantaneously. With the oil, I would as Bob said, I would think it's easy just to pop it up and so it floats off. Um, but I think you'll find it balances out as long as you've got enough. Um, submergent plants in there, and have you got water in this to get some shade, or is it very exposed to the sun? It's quite exposed because I've got a, a large water lily, it's had to about a third of it. Ah, and just if you can just stir the water or put a few aerated, that does make a big difference. You, you can get these little submersible pumps and just getting more oxygen in the water, and you can get very neat self contained kits now that you can just put in there, and that really does help. Um, and if it is something like blanket weed, I mean, they say barley straw, don't they? But you probably have not got that, have you? No. No. So I, I would try and get some movement of water um, and the shade is, I mean, the water is only just covering now, so that will kick in and you'll probably find it sorts itself out um, over the next few weeks, I would think. But Matt, very important to have a water source, though, isn't it? And particularly when we're having these sort of dry spells for, for wildlife. It is brilliant for wildlife. As soon as you have water, you're going to have wildlife there. I was just thinking of a, another little tip for a small pond. You can get wildlife friendly aquatic dyes. Uh, they only last about three months, but it looks like a tea bag. You drop it in and it will turn the water to a much darker colour. And the beauty of it is it just cuts out the lights of the algae and the blanket weed. Obviously some of it still will float to the top and you'll need to pull that out, but now your water lilies are in leaf, they're going to photosynthesize go to the top. Pop that in, the water does look dark and it just helps cut out some of the, uh, the lights of the algae. We've had much better results at Wisby with that than we have barley straw, actually. But your ward at Wisby's moving, is it? Not in every no. pond. Okay. No, not in every pond. Because I it, always thought with the dye, if you don't keep agitating water, it sinks. But you find even in still water, no, it stays it, black. No, it doesn't. It oh, no, no, I didn't fine. realize yeah. that. They are good. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, no, they are good. Mm -hmm. uh, but as Bunny said, some, some aeration definitely helps too. Okay. tulip tree in our garden and I've never done anything to it. Uh, we've lived there for six years now but we understand the previous owner of the house used to prune it every year. Um, so my question is when and how is the best time to prune a tulip tree? Matty, can you describe a tulip tree for us first of all? They are magnificent one of my favourite trees. They have a really really unique leaf that almost goes to a straight line and it has these two almost like horns sticking out either the side and then the flowers which is going to flower at the moment so it's nothing quite like it in fact if you're not very observant you can walk past them and not notice it's in flower but it's like this creamy cup it's tulip shaped it's got an orange stripe and it's got some green to it as well and they are beautiful and i actually recommend them a lot because they're a tree that doesn't seem to be suffering with pests and disease like lots of trees do unfortunately and then they're coping with the climate extreme as well so you know but tulip trees, to go to your question, if I may, is the best thing you just don't touch. You take off some of the lower branches, perhaps, so you know, to improve sight lines or if you're gardening around it. But they are magnificent. You don't touch them. So I'm very keen to know what would the previous owner do it to it every year? Uh, apparently, he was cutting off quite a lot of the lower branches on the side. Okay. I mean, if, if you're going to prune those, my advice would be, and I don't know how good you would have pruned, but are there stubs left, or did he cut? so good-natured, they're so healthy and they grow in so many places. 
as opposed to a Jack Russell of tree. <laughs> just something that's a bit more awkward. And I always think, whenever I think of tulip tree, I think of Tony Kirk and the Labradors. But they are magnificent, and I think people tend to think they've got to prune things. But unless it's getting in the way, or it's going to fall on something, or it's a problem, you know, and you've got space, just enjoy it. And the space is the thing, though, isn't it? Because they do get pretty big. They do. They do. But if you if you love the foliage of them, it is a tree you can hard prune uh, to the ground almost. We we have some of these being well on the borders, and we school them like you would a foxglove tree or a, a catalpa, and the leaves come up then twice the size. And there's some lovely variegated ones which are, are really pretty. And literally late winter, take your hard back, and then they all bounce back. Give it a handful of food just to compensate for what you've done. But we get huge leaves on them. We hard prune the Liriodentum chinense, the Chinese tulip tree, which has quite a, a white underside to the leaf, and it's beautiful. So, you know, if you don't have space for one, you can do the hard pruning thing. Obviously, they don't flower when you hard prune them, but the foliage makes up for it. Do enjoy it and take it easy. Yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> I'd like to see you. Well, I hope you enjoyed learning how it's done. And